Please pray with me. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. John Christ is a Christian comedian. What that means is he is a Christian and he is also a comedian. And what he does is he travels around to different churches, does stand-up, uh, he, he does tours, that sort of thing. He also does sketch comedy and puts it online. And uh, we are going to begin the sermon with one of his sketches. So I want to let you know ahead of time so that you can like stretch and get ready to laugh. This is supposed to be funny. You can play the video. Previously on Church Hunters. This is your first church. This is Creekside First Baptist. Honestly, right up front, uh, didn't love the name. The Sunday morning experience was just a little too traditional. Hey guys, how we doing? Hey, good. Doing how are good, you? Doing good, doing good. So I know you didn't love the traditional vibe of the last place, okay? Yeah. okay. But I think this church is really going to do it for you. Yeah. It takes relevance to a whole new level. Behind me, you will see molded clay, jar art, tapestry, canvas, mosaic wow. church. Mm, I love beautiful. it. Right? So you've heard of interdenominational. Mm -hmm. Right. And you've heard of non-denominational. Mm -hmm. Well, this church identifies as interdenominational. Wow. Wow, that's, that's perfect for us. It. it really is. But here's the kicker. A lot of celebrities go here. Yeah. What? Jeff Foxworthy. Oh, we love him. Yep. We really do. Ben Higgins from ABC's The Bachelor. Perfect. Several Real Housewives. Ooh, and know. Usher even came here one time. <laughs> yeah. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, wow. well, follow me. Come on. Let's do it. So refreshing. Honestly, that last church was just way too traditional. It was yeah. too much. It was like we left there feeling convicted. Like, Ugh. ugh. Right? Right. We're just, we're looking for more of a Tony Robbins type sermon. Like inspiration, like a TED Talk with a Bible verse. Yes. Oh, yes. Right? It's perfect here. We love it. It really is. We love it. Awesome. Cool. Well, you guys know a lot of contemporary pastors speak out of the Message Translation Bible. Mm -hmm. Right. Or this pastor speaks out of a brand new translation. It's the Tumblr Bible. Oh, Shut up. We love Tumblr, up. though. This is great. Wow. A lot of emojis, a lot of abbreviations. Oh, I couldn't ask for And how many seats in here? Oh, it is 6,000 altogether. Babe, wow. 6,000. Mm -hmm. I got to be in this worship band. That's Imagine true. me up on that jumbotron mid guitar solo. Do you know how many Instagram likes you get? Oh, oh my gosh. We find it hard to find a church right now because I grew up Catholic. I grew up and Baptist, so. So, like, we, we drink. Yeah, but just in private. I mean, obviously, you get it. Basically, in terms of, like, worship, I think we're looking for, like, a Jesus culture type feel. Oh, I right. love them. Hillsong, obviously. Oh, obviously. leading you to the cross? Hillsong's great. Like a Bethel minus the spontaneous yeah. stuff. Yeah. Just for me, I connect in worship more when the leader is attractive. Personally, I'm a Carrie Job guy. Oh, okay. Well, she's married. So. Um, so is Christian Stanfield. Wow. So one of my personal favorite things about this church is the service times. Okay. There's an 8.30, a 10, a 1 o'clock, a 5.30, and even a 7 o'clock service. Oh, there's nothing around like 2-ish? Yeah, for us, for what we need, 2, 2.15 is best. Yes. Uh, how many songs do they do during worship? Usually five, five and a half, depending on where the spirit leads. Oh, wow, babe, is that, is that a lot? lot? Well, if that's too that much for you, like they have a program here called the Worship Assist Program. Okay. So if you ever get tired during worship, an intern will come out and just hold your arms up. You just keep worshiping the King of Glory. Just like that. Wow. I love it. Oh, you can still look super spiritual. Huh? And my arms get so tired from yoga. Oh, same. I actually like this church. I think we can make it work. It was all right. I mean, it was it was good, but pers like I emailed the pastor and he didn't immediately respond. So uh, we're taking these vessels elsewhere. That's it. Yeah. Uh, we'll let our Princeton interns know that they're going to need to hold up your hands uh, <laughs> next year if you get tired. Now, that video was meant to be funny, and hopefully you did laugh. I heard laughter. He obviously is poking fun a bit at the consumerist mentality with which folks approach finding and belonging to a church. And while it surely gave us a laugh or two, I wonder, did any of it connect? Did any of it maybe even sting just a little bit? 
While the extremes John takes in the video are humorous, talking about, oh, for us, we really need a 2 o'clock, 2.15 time, that would be best, the sentiment of the video is also a little convicting because we have to admit that we like our church a certain way. Because we do like our church a certain way, and we shouldn't have to apologize for that. Right? Sometimes children don't get along. When my sister and I were growing up, we tended to fight about the same things that most kids probably do. And when you put more than one child into a closed family system and into a confined space long enough, we all know that they are bound to, at some point, start fighting over who has what, who gets what. That's my toy. Those are my french fries. Don't eat them. That's my video game. Don't touch it. When my sister and I would have spats like this, my mom would always say, remember, sharing is caring. <laughs> sharing is caring. Are you familiar with this phrase? Even as a kid, I never understood it. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it means if you care about this person, you will share with them. Well, I liked my sister and all, but I really didn't care if she wanted my french fries. I wanted them. That's the whole point. I don't care. If I cared what she wanted, I would already be sharing. So telling me that sharing is caring is sort of, I don't know, backwards or senseless or something. I was, I was the type of kid that would have responded better if, if I'd just been told, hey, I know you don't want to share your french fries, but you're going to because I said so. <laughs> and so I would because I was told to, but not because sharing is caring. Well, sharing is caring might as well have been the mission statement of the early church described in our Acts 2 passage. It says they sold all of their possessions and goods and distributed the proceeds to anyone who had need. Jeez. Apparently the spirit that began a work earlier in this chapter at Pentecost was not through with the church yet. Apparently, that miraculous event led to some pretty radical living. And see, we don't pay much attention to these verses. We love the Pentecost story. We spend a lot of time there, make sure we hit it every year. But we'd rather skip over these ones. Because you see, first of all, it sounds a little bit like an experiment in socialism, and we've all been taught that's a very naughty word. And second, because we may believe sharing is caring, but apparently not as much as this early church. And third, because it leaves us feeling all convicted, like that video did, except in Acts, there's nothing to laugh at in the passage. The early church was filled with individuals who made every part of their life, their being, and their church about others, not about themselves. So all of that, I like my church this way, I want things this way stuff, starts to sound kind of small in the face of what was going on in the early church. And if we follow that thought to its logical conclusion, we know that the word church is best never preceded by the word my. The church from its very beginning was never about being my church. It was about at best our church and even better your church. How would our mindsets, our feelings, our generosity, our charity, our kindness, our selfishness, how would all these things change if we truly began looking around at the faces in the pews next to us and the visitor who walked through our door and started saying, this is your church first. Welcome to your church. How can we make this your church? 
In his teaching from Matthew, Jesus goes even further than the early church. These confusing verses sound awful. We thought Jesus was all about love and peace and happiness, and here he is saying he's setting a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. Jesus' words cut to the chase and cut to the core, just like the sword that he has brought, a sword that at least initially is not an image of death or violence but an image of a device that separates, that divides, that splits. But strange to hear words of supposed division coming out of Jesus' mouth. So what does Christ divide us from? Well, the next verses tell us the things that we want most the things that we think we need, the things that I want, and if I had it my way, these would be most important to me. Do you hear all those pronouns? And they're not bad things. They're things like a father, a mother, a child. And in a great reversal, Christ says, the path that he is bringing will call us not only to consider those things as nothing, but to welcome enemies into our household, to forsake the things that we love most for the sake of the other and even the enemy. That's the sort of calling he's bringing. It's, it's hyperbolic, but he's getting at what it means to be the church. And this is why it cannot, should not, will not ever be my church. That language will never be okay because Christ has called us to let go of the things that we want and the way that we want things. He's called us to look at him and look at the other above all else. That alone is what it means to be church. This is what it means to be alive in Christ and what Christ means when he finally uses that sword imagery in an ironic wordplay um, as an image for death and says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, Christ didn't come to bring division. He does want us united and his message is If you find me, if you put me first over the things that you want, you will find that unity. Many years ago, I led a youth retreat where the theme of the retreat was, and I'm not kidding, get over yourself. And that's what I preached to those youth all weekend long. Get over yourself. See, getting ourselves out of the way seems to be one of the great tasks and difficulties of the Christian life. To move aside the life that we so desperately want and want to choose and instead choose the life that Christ wants and the life that others need and want. Putting ourselves and our desires last, losing our life so that we may truly find it. Getting over ourselves is what this strange passage in Matthew is all about, and the call to do so will meet us in a hundred ways every single day, and will meet us in any number of ways as a church congregation. And the first step to doing so, to getting over ourselves, I think, is learning to remove the words, my church, or my worship, or my kind of music, or any such construct from our church vocabulary? Can we instead learn to say, our church? Can we learn to care most about how we are sharing the church with others to the point where we even begin to say, your church first? Because if we can learn to say it, then we will slowly learn to think it. 
And if we can learn to think it, then we will learn to act it. And as the Spirit helps and guides us along, we will become something that resembles that early church, the Spirit moving strong and powerful through us, caring not for ourselves and thinking of others first, giving of ourselves so that the needs of others are met, sacrificing what we want church to be and what we want our lives to be for the sake of this calling to simply love others and for the sake of the one who speaks that calling. After all, this really isn't my church. It's not really your church either. It isn't even our church. This, we, are his church. Amen.